So the, the last presentation of this session will be made by uh, two researchers uh, separated by about uh, 3,000 kilometers. So uh, Kostan Zakuro uh, from the University of Helsinki in Finland and Vaktan Keshkovili uh, from the Georgian American University in Georgia. So their text is called Living in the Thieves' Way, the Social and Cultural Capital of Causality in Georgia. So the floor is yours and you have 20 minutes. All right, uh, thanks very much uh, everyone. Can you hear me fine? All right. Uh, sorry, here it says uh, bad quality network. Oh, not. Anyway, thanks very much everyone for having us here. Um, my name is Costanza. I'm an, an anthropologist and I work uh, as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Helsinki. And uh, I've been working on this paper with my colleague uh, Vaho Vachtang, who is a sociologist from uh, Georgia. Uh, this study, uh, can you see the slides moving? No. No, not yet. No. I don't. Uh, OK, now? Yeah. OK, great. So this is just uh, a slide on the project uh, within which our study uh, has taken place, which is a project funded by the ERC called the Gulag Ecos, which looks at prisons and ethnicity, broadly speaking, in the post-Soviet space. But uh, coming to our paper, uh, we, um, we want to analyze uh, narratives and practices of carcerality within and across the three different uh, uh, but interrelated spaces. The prison, the street, uh, and a shelter for homeless people. The research uh, took place in Tbilisi, Georgia, uh, in a tent shelter, which was opened uh, uh, to help the homeless in 2013, and which is our fieldwork site. Many residents of this so-called tent city had been in prison at some point of their life. Uh, our study looks at the ways in which a prison experience and familiarity with everyday um, uh, life prison norms inform the ways in which people understand, value and fit in social and spatial realities outside the prison walls. Uh, we follow uh, Loic Vacan's perspective on the tight intertwinement between prison and street, which keeps uh, certain parts of the population locked in what he calls a deadly symbiosis. Uh, we locate the tenth city within this circuit as a place which acts both as a centripetal uh, and centrifugal force with respect to the prison and the street. People move across and between these spaces, bringing knowledge, beliefs, experiences, lifestyles and reputations within them. The normative figure around which these spaces, values, uh, practices and relationships uh, coalesce is the Kurdi, the thief, uh, which here refers to Kanonieri Kurdi, uh, in Russia, Vorev Zakoni, and in English, uh, thieves in law. We are going to talk about them uh, more uh, in details in a bit, but uh, for now that's to say that these are um, criminal figures um, on which much of the Soviet and post-Soviet prison subculture is based. In Georgia, the influence of these thieves and the set of norms that bound them together stretches far, be far beyond the prison as an institution. The adjective um, uh, kurduli uh, and living a kurdulad, like living in the thieves' way, uh, is a set of values uh, and behaviors which embraces normative images of Georgian masculinity, a model for generations of men, particularly, uh, particularly at a young age. Uh, our paper conceptualizes ideas and practices of living Kurdula, the like thieves, in the thieves way, as a social and cultural capital that people uh, draw upon to live in and move across different carceral spaces. Uh, just uh, um, a few uh, notes on the methodology and our field which, by the way, uh, Vaho Vachtang did, uh, I didn't, uh, so it, it's all his uh, merit, and if you have questions on this section, I will be happy to answer uh, um, to them. So, uh, the Ten City uh, was opened uh, by the mayor of Tbilisi in 2013, uh, and um, uh, at the time of the fieldwork was, uh, uh, um, uh, had like 395 sorry, 97 registered residents over uh, an overall capacity of 500 people. Uh, from February to April 2014, uh, Vachtang conducted 22 in-depth interviews uh, with city residents, medical staff, municipal officers, volunteers and military personnel. Interviews were integrated with participant and non-participant observation recorded uh, as field notes. 
Um, Wachtan got access to the tent city through a friend who worked for a charity involved in uh, um, serving uh, food and helping with cleaning and other maintenance and supervision work in the shelter. The charity staff estimated that around a half of the shelter population had been to prison at some point of their life. According to uh, the deputy director of this charity, which, which was called the Catharsis, um, most of the city residents did not have another place to live uh, or someone to stay with, while some had a place somewhere around Tbilisi and were registered there to get uh, free food and medical assistance. Um, people were usually taken to the shelter by the police, uh, which found them randomly in the street, often, often in need of help. However, staying in the shelter was on a completely voluntary basis. The shelter looked anything but a homey place. Tents and bunk beds were provided by the Georgian army. Tents were heated by wood stoves. In addition, indoor spaces were kept isolated from uh, the um, outside by sandbags also from the military, surrounding the tent's perimeter. The tent city territory uh, was delimited by a metal fence with a gate guarded by military personnel. The police was also uh, responsible of order and security and patrolled the tent city by car or on foot. Uh, the catharsis staff, medical personnel and residents themselves shared information on the main challenges of everyday life in the city. Among these, the officially forbidden consumption of alcohol was regarded as a primary source of troubles and violence, along with uh, a main culprit for physical and mental illness. Beside high blood pressure, gastroenterological illnesses and diseases connected to the liver, tuberculosis was a fairly widespread, particularly among residents who had been in prison. And that's why a lot of uh, staff and security people there wore a mask already, already at, that at that time. And um, we have uh, some pictures that Vajo took uh, and I will uh, quickly share with you. Uh, so this is uh, one of the main entrance of the of the shelter with some of the residents uh, sitting around. This is uh, the internal of uh, of one of the tents um, and personal belongings of some of the of the residents and the wood uh, used to um, heat the the tents. Uh, a fence bed to get a little bit of privacy. An old lady arriving to the shelter. Uh, police checking in the tents that everything is okay medical personnel. Um, this is a, a sign that says that uh, alcohol uh, consumption is strictly uh, forbidden in, in the shelter. Uh, some people walking around the shelter and, and staff uh, cleaning um, an old, I mean, kind of older resident uh, knitting and other residents playing uh, cards. There are many more, but we just did a selection. Um, I will just keep uh, the sort of like theoretical bit on Bakang and deadly symbiosis because I think everybody is probably familiar to this uh, literature. Uh, just a few words to say that uh, Vakang idea of uh, deadly symbiosis is relevant to our case of Georgia uh, because Georgia uh, did experience what Vakang uh, defines as the penalization of poverty, in particular uh, following neoliberal reforms implemented by the government of Mikhail Saakashvili uh, after the Rose Revolution in 2003. So on the one hand, we have this very strong increase of the penal apparatus of the state, and on the other hand, this very well-known dynamic of cutting down um, state expenses for uh, welfare. Um, there was a very, very strong crackdown of the state to against not only, uh, let's say, big organized crime and corruption, but first and foremost on like a kind of small everyday uh, practices of everyday life. Um, so as a result, a lot of people ended up in prison. The prison population increased about 300% in a few years. And um, uh, because there was no uh, uh, sort of like any kind of rehabilitation policy in place, uh, most of people uh, ended up in one of these kind of like deadly symbiosis cir uh, circuits uh, uh, in and out of prison or living in the street also because uh, they had to pay a lot of money uh, for uh, legal expenses and, and, and things like that. So many of them actually ended up without the house uh, while being in prison and they had to uh, uh, then either living in the street once being released or maybe you know, take advantage of this kind of uh, uh, places like the, the tent city that uh, we have been talking about. So looking at this little scheme of, of, of the um, 
uh, relate, sort of spatial relation and mobility relations between prison and street and shelter. We we have uh, just mentioned that uh, both um, um, that the street was a main supplier of uh, population for the prison, uh, and that both prison from the street and uh, from the prison uh, ended up in the shelter for 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 various reasons. Um, but uh, so in a way, the shelter acted as a, this kind of a catalyst for. Uh, people who were either homeless uh, or uh, became homeless as a result of their incarceration. Um, uh, but the shelter also worked as a kind of a centrifugal force, uh, which uh, sort of um, pushed somehow people uh, towards the street uh, or towards the prison again. Um, so, for example, people were free to move uh, uh, from uh, the shelter to the street and back uh, and actually they pointed out that that was the main difference between living in prison and living in the shelter they didn't see uh, the opportunity of going to city as a, such a exciting one because they didn't really have any anything to do there but they uh, they, they could move freely more or less and they did uh, plus there were uh, various kind of affective links uh, between uh, people living in the shelter, uh, who uh, whom might had maybe uh, families uh, outside, uh, um, uh, and and they were kind of like moving back and forth uh, to them, um, uh, but. Um, um, the shelter uh, could also be a kind of intermediate uh, place for people who had been in prison and then went back to prison because uh, the shelter had uh, its kind of uh, formal uh, rules uh, which uh, were sanctioned if they were uh, broken. Um, so, for example, uh, there was uh, this uh, participant uh, who was uh, called uh, Zaza and uh, he uh, was 59 years old at the time of the fieldwork and uh, he had spent 36 years of his life in prison. And uh, uh, he lost his house uh, because he had a big debt uh, towards the state and he was living in the shelter with his wife and the son and he was involved in a lot of fights and violent episodes in the shelter and uh, everybody was very worried that he would end up uh, in prison again very soon. Um, and once after one of those uh, fights, he told uh, Bajo, uh, our, our researcher, look, uh, this is my life, I cannot live in another way, but I'm not going to back to prison today. And he didn't actually because uh, the, the 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 result the, the sort of this fight didn't have any kind of uh, uh, consequence at, at the time. But the prison was a sort of ever ever present, ever lingering uh, um, presence uh, over the life of of, of this prison. Um, uh, um, so that's for the sort of mobility and spatial uh, link between uh, these uh, three spaces. But uh, uh, now I want to talk a little bit about uh, the um, symbolic, moral and cultural link between uh, these uh, three carceral spaces, which are embodied in uh, the Kurdi, the, the figure of the thief. So uh, thieves. Uh, uh, in law, uh, which in Georgian are uh, tra uh, translated as Kanonieri Kurdebi and in Russia Boris uh, Zakoni, are uh, some kind of semi-mythical figures of uh, professional uh, criminals uh, which um, have had a huge symbolic and normative power in society and culture uh, in the former Soviet Union and Georgia in uh, particular. Um, uh, they uh, have originated as characters in Stalin's labor camp during the 1930s and proliferated across the Soviet prisons. Uh, with the relative loosening of the state's authoritarian grip after Stalin's death and following the demise of socialist regimes at the beginning of the 1990s, the thieves progressively moved outside the prison and became more and more similar to mafia-type organized crime. Um, the thieves are bound together by a set of norms uh, called in Georgian gageba, which means uh, what is understood uh, roughly. Um, and the core principle of this gageba uh, included the prohibition of collaborating with state authorities in any way, of having a family and a stable residence, of working uh, uh, and accumulating wealth. Uh, in our research experience, understanding of Gageba are strictly linked to two attributes. The first is Kurduli from Kurdi, thief, in the thief's way, and the second is Kuchuri from Kucha, street, in the street way. So uh, both attributes refer not only to the norms mentioned above, but also to specific language, bodily gestures and performances, which, uh, while thought as being born in prison, are used by people in the street to recognize and communicate with one another. 
Um, here is kind of uh, some quotes of what uh, what being a thief and living in a thief way mean for some of our participants. So what is a thief? Givi uh, was 28 at the time of the study and with uh, 12 years of prison experience. You should never lie, always say the truth, be smart, be educated, have knowledge, be clean from inside, respect hygiene rules, live properly and respect other people, be polite and not rude. You should not touch the others and others should not touch you. Um, and then uh, thieves, uh, no respect for women, doctors and so on. Real thieves do not need to advertise themselves. Only those who are not thieves and want to be thieves do that. Thieves don't smoke and don't drink. If you are a drug addict uh, with an unstable mind, what kind of Cordoba of thievishness is that? If you're not a strong person. And then we have this quote from Zaza, the, the resident I mentioned to you before, um, that he basically equates uh, living like a thief uh, as the only way of living like a proper human. So he says, like, how do you explain to live a, a human life um, uh, to someone who has never been in prison and doesn't know how the real human life in prison is? And that uh, brings us to uh, this sort of hierarchical relation between uh, these uh, three carceral spaces, which uh, put the prison very uh, sort of uh, firmly at the top of the of this hierarchy, um, uh, as uh, the, the the place where the only the the real thieves can only live and the real sort of human being can only live. Uh, so it's the place uh, where uh, the, 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 the highest uh, morality uh, of, a, of, of a person is realized through the, 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 the upholding and the performing of these uh, rules. Um, so um, uh, thanks to, to these rules and thanks to the thieves, uh, the prisons are places of order and cleanliness at the moral, social and spatial level. Um, on the contrary, uh, the street is where anarchy and chaos reigns. Street life is regulated by pointless violence and relationships are based not on honor, uh, but on prevarication and opportunism and people uh, behave in degrading and self-destructive ways. The shelter in this regard has a sort of ambivalent position because uh, on the one hand uh, is considered as uh, an inauthentic and hybrid space uh, from the perspective of both the prison and the street. Um, uh, from the street perspective, of course, the shelter uh, uh, is uh, a place where there is a lot of uh, control and is a, a sort of uh, um, uh, place of surveillance and institutionalized the place of kind of state state uh, control um uh, unlike the street that is seen as kind of more free uh, place. But of course, the shelter also offer some uh, shelter and some protection from the unpredictability of the street. So this is something that all residents uh, uh, do uh, recognize and do appreciate. But in all cases, both the street and the shelter are uh, seen in a kind of a negative way, not only from uh, people who have been in prison and now are living in the shelter, but also from a medical person uh, administration, uh, charity staff, uh, and even some of the military and, and, and the police uh, personnel, um, uh, because uh, precisely the, these are places where real thieves uh, cannot live and you cannot really uh, uphold and abide by the code of the thieves, and, um, uh, but you can only pretend to be a thief while not being it, which is even worse than not being a thief uh, as such. Um, Five minutes so, Yes, thank you. So just a quick quote uh, about uh, this, how it has been kind of framed by our participants. So, for example, when again, this doctor who lived in the in the work in the in the, in the shelter uh, was asked by by Vajo, uh, does life here go according to the thief's way? He said, no, uh, here it's a street anarchy. Power is the priority. And you also say that uh, here life goes according to the street rule, to the rule of the wolves. Um, and then there is uh, again uh, this uh, Zaza, this resident who says like, uh, oh, people here gets all eaten up after one or two glasses to the thieves and uh, the old boys, other criminal authorities. But in fact, they are all rats and vultures. So they, 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 they pretend and they even perform as thieves, but they are actually uh, not. Um, 
So uh, just to conclude, this is a conclusion is very, very open to kind of uh, a criticism and, and, and feedback. But uh, uh, what we want to do in the conclusion is to um, uh, propose a revisitation of the notion of carceral citizenship in the light of our empirical findings. Uh, on the one hand, uh, living a Kurdulad is connected to carceral citizenship as framed by uh, Miller and Stewart, among others, as an alternative, uh, as an alternate and second class citizenship category and a distinct form of political membership. On the other hand, we propose the concept of a carceral citizenship from below to refer to people's own understanding and framing of themselves and citizens of carceral spaces and the narratives and practices that they engage in to fit this type of citizenship. We do not want to minimize the structural problems which relegate certain parts of the population in the position of carceral citizens or indeed romanticize this position. Rather, while highlighting how formal, political and economic and social institutions uh, systematically deny uh, conventional citizenship to these people, we investigate the ways in which the social and cultural capital or living Kurdulad, like thieves, underpins al alternative forms of membership in carceral spaces. Oh, sorry. Last bit. Uh, so Miller and Stewart write that the carceral citizenship is a condition which is experienced by and enacted upon people convicted of a crime. While they uh, elaborate on the way in which state and non-state actors create the carceral citizens and perpetuate such a condition, they say less on the way in which carceral citizens make sense of this condition themselves, appropriate and reproduce it. The systematic exclusion of these people from conventional citizenship do not prevent them from redefining their own specific membership in society as carceral citizens in an active way. The universal sets of individual and collective rights, duties and norms upon which citizenship in carceral spaces is built is enshrined in the Gageba code and embodied in the figure of the teeth, the Kurdi. Living Kurdulad is a universal social and cultural capital uh, which defines membership across different carceral spaces. In this regard, uh, we want to think of the notion of carceral citi citizenship from below as a potentially powerful conceptual tool for understanding these dynamics, uh, struggles and claims to social and political memberships of people uh, from the marge. Um, thank you very much for your attention and your time, and uh, we are very happy to answer to any question you might have. Thank you, thank you, Constanza, and thank you, Vaktang, who are here in uh, in backstage. Uh, thank you for this excellent presentation, uh, which takes us a little out of prisons and into the streets and shelters, but it uh, it still brings us uh, back to the confinement. It's a uh, fascinating uh, ethnographic works, uh, and uh, I am uh, in uh, in admiration about about that. Um, so first uh, question, uh, do you see some similarities with what we heard about re-entry in, uh, in session two? And uh, are there similarities with, with uh, what is going on in hyper-carceral countries uh, like in the, the United States of America, for example? All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thanks for the question. Oh yeah, uh, the session two was very inspiring uh, and uh, I personally see a lot of a lot of connections of course uh, uh, when we called about this uh, uh, these circuits, uh, this kind of uh, uh, dreadful circuits uh, in and out of prison, uh, the, the issue of re-entry is very, very, uh, um, uh, very important. Uh, in the case of Georgia, as I briefly mentioned, um, uh, it's it's similar and uh, and different from, uh, for example, the little I know about the United States, uh, because uh, and that also uh, um, brings us back with the no to the notion of this carceral citizenship, because. Uh, 
it seems to me that uh, this idea of uh, um, um, uh, re-entry, the way we 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 heard about uh, about it uh, in in the other session, and the way uh, it is framed in connection with this carceral citizenship idea, is very much based on this very high level of uh, surveillance and management uh, of this population. Whereas in the case of Georgia, um, uh, uh, it, it seems to me that actually these people are carceral citizens uh, first and foremost because nobody really cares about them. So the, 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 they, they don't surveil them, they just uh, lock them uh, here or there. They could be the street, it could be the, 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 the shelter, which is a very kind of random institution uh, which uh, popped by in 2013 and now it has been moved to some other place, uh, but is very um, kind of not, uh, uh, it doesn't, it, there doesn't seem to be uh, for the good or for the bad, this kind of continuum between uh, um, between uh, the shelter and the street and the prison from an institutional point of view as a way of surveilling and disciplining these people. These places are just three spaces uh, in which these people are, are kind of locked, uh, but uh, they, they I don't see them to be uh, very heavily kind of controlled and disciplined by any kind of state or, or non-state um, authority. So that might be maybe a kind of, of, of difference. Why is that the case? I don't know if it's kind of a policy uh, ch um, choice uh, from, from the Georgian state or it's probably something that also uh, we can see in other 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 contexts uh, probably. Um, can you, can you uh, say again the second question, uh, uh, David, uh, about hyper-incarceration? Okay. Yeah, the, the second question is, uh, are there similarities with with uh, what is going on in uh, hyper carceral countries, uh, for example, in the in the USA? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, the similarities are that the, the policies that the uh, Georgian government uh, uh, from 2003 to 2012 put in place, they have been uh, explicitly modeled on this uh, uh, zero tolerance approach. Uh, and they were they were laws that were like a very, very clearly taken from this context and applied to the Georgian context. So the, the, the main uh, uh, sort of uh, pillars of these uh, policies were like, uh, uh, like put in prison, basically everybody was even remotely liable of something even remotely conceivable as a crime, uh, petty crimes, informal practices are uh, broadly understood. Um, and then uh, also uh, the financialization, we have, we have already discussed about that uh, today um, of, of, of the penal system. So um, charging prisoners either for buying their, their, their freedom or once they were, they were in prison for any kind of service they they, they wanted to get even though uh, um, um, prisons are public in georgia are held by uh, owned by the state but everything had been monetized um so yeah of course that like especially in these uh like uh two terms of this uh, President Saakashvili, there were so many parallels between the, the United States and Georgia, very explicitly made and proudly, I think, made by the Georgian government. Um, now, I think we can say that uh, Georgian current Georgian government looks a bit more at the so-called the European model and the Council of Europe uh, guidelines uh, to frame their, their, their prison system, but yeah. Uh, uh, I will say that. Thank you. Uh, maybe two two more questions because uh, we are running out of time. Uh, first question from Ettore Asoni. Uh, how do Georgians who have uh, had who had no contact with the criminal justice system look at the thieves, uh, and what is the the role of women in the thieves world? Oh, this is a great question. I think maybe the, the uh, Vachtang, Vacho, do you want to answer to this question? Because you did so much research on the the thieves in society and uh, I can also do that, but maybe you want to do it. Vachtang, you are muted. You are my, yeah. So now it should be okay. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me this kind of word. Uh, uh, about women in, in civs culture and in Georgian culture is 
is the role is quite uh, like uh, important in terms that uh, uh, they are mothers. Mother of citizen law has kind of very uh, kind of power uh, nowadays because all you know that uh, after uh, uh, Rico camp campaign in uh, um, actually anti-organized crime campaign uh, which was launched in 2006 that was the, the prototype of uh, uh, anti-organized crime camp campaign that was launched in 1970s in the United States that's the law recall recall law so called and um, uh, in law mostly are now nowadays uh, are very active in in Europe um, and in, in other post-Soviet um, uh, states and who is left here are uh, like women, a mother or sisters of sisters-in-law who are having still some kind of power in, in the society, uh, symbolic or like kind of, uh, they, they can, can solve some problems related to the, the dis discussions or some, some conflict issues. Uh, and the sisters, sister of uh, sisters-in-law or uh, sister, um, or some rel relative of sisters-in-law, it still have some kind of uh, some kind of uh, strengths in society, like it is kind of untouched person as a woman to not not to you are not kind of you are framed somehow to have some kind of uh, sexual desires or some kind of to look at it as as a as a woman that can be loved. Uh, maybe uh, Constanza, you want to add something about this issue? Oh, yeah, very briefly about how um, what uh, Georgians who haven't been in touch with the criminal justice uh, think about thieves. Um, I think thieves are very uh, popular, uh, both as a kind of uh, um, cultural figure, like uh, there are a lot of uh, um, uh, cultural production around thieves, first and foremost, these uh, chansons uh, of, of, of the thieves, uh, but also um, kind of uh, um, uh, films, of course, uh, and 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 uh, uh, a whole way of uh, speaking and and moving and uh, and uh, uh, and performing, like with your body and your and 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 your speech, uh, is very much thought uh, as being a kurduli, as being like a part of this thief uh, world and. Uh, Everybody can engage in that from like a very small children that uh, Vaho did the research on, uh, and uh, to you know like any 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 kind of, of person. And uh, in 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 our research of, on the shelter, for example, one of the person who gave a more most detailed information about how a thief live, uh, what thief should be, and blah blah blah. Is a doctor in the camp, in the shelter, so not somebody who had uh, any any sort of a prison experience, or not uh, a criminal authority, or not even a kind of like a street man. Um, uh, so the, 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 this normative, uh, the, the like uh, and symbolic influence of the thieves uh, used to be really strong in Georgian society in the 1990s, and whether it's still that strong, probably it's debatable, but uh, it is something, if you go to Georgia and ask uh, about thieves, uh, I think pretty much everybody will tell you uh, something and will tell you maybe not entirely positive things, but I think there was this kind of uh, widespread uh, understanding of that they somehow were good uh, in maintaining some kind of order in very kind of chaotic uh, times and chaotic uh, spaces. Uh, whether that is just a stereotype or not, but that's yeah, that's what I see. Thank you. So the, there are still several questions, but uh, it's 3 p.m. o'clock, so uh, uh, I need to, to conclude. So thank you all for uh, the questions and uh, special thanks uh, to our speakers.